Hello, must readers! I'm Erin Popelka. I curate Must Read Fiction, a place for people who know that life is better with a novel in hand. And I am so excited to be here today with Anka Silagi, um, author of the novel Daughters of the Air. Um, Anka was uh, raised in Brooklyn. She has published in the Los Angeles Review of Books, Gastronomica, Electric Literature, and Fairy Tale Review. She currently lives in Seattle. Welcome to Must Read Fiction. Thank you for talking with me. Thanks so much for having me. Let's start things off. Tell me about this beautiful novel, Daughters of the Air. So Daughters of the Air is about a girl named Pluta whose father disappears uh, during Argentina's Dirty War. And um, her mother is unable to um, explain what has happened and instead puts her away in a boarding school in Connecticut. And so Pluta must struggle with the unknown. She ends up running away to New York in the in 1980. So the, the novel uh, looks both at his disappearance and her running away. Mm, fascinating. Um, and so, and it's also uh, kind of set in historical times too, set in the late 70s and early 80s, um, as well as having this kind of international element. Mm -hmm. um, speak to me a little bit about that in terms of, you know, kind of engaging with that time and engaging with an international place. Um, so there was a lot of research that I did up front, um, just years of reading histories and memoirs and journalism and um, and then, you know, having grown up in New York in the 80s, like that, that side of things I felt more confident in. So I spent a lot of time with Argentina. And um, finally, uh, in 2010, we went to uh, Buenos Aires. Um, and it was super helpful to be in the city and, you know, smell, you know, get a sense of the air and like the breadth of the streets and the, the narrow alleys. And um, we took a wonderful walking tour with this guy, Eduardo, who's a volunteer. Um, tour guide and you just you tell them tell him what you're interested in. and he spent three hours with us um, just showing us all around the city and giving us his take on Argentina's history and Buenos Aires's history and the Jewish community uh, the, the family in my novel is Jewish and so I was especially interested in that and um, he took us to various neighborhoods and um, and even like read parts of my novel and gave me some feedback. Oh, about amazing! It, which is super nice of him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then we also had uh, coffee with a couple um, who had also lived through that time in in Belgrano, the neighborhood where uh, the family lives. The family in my novel lives, and so they were also giving them, giving me their take. I think um, at the time, she, uh, the wife was working as a school teacher. Um, and so I was really interested in trying to figure out what is it like, like what are like what are the children being told, um, and and that sort of thing. So that was really helpful as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so kind of so with that research and you know kind of with this idea of the story, let's go back just a step. What was the original idea? Like what sparked the idea of this novel for you? So. Um, a long time ago, like 15 years ago, I, uh, I read uh, Ann Carson's autobiography of Red and there was a tiny little mention of the Dirty War in there, the disappearance. There, was like a, there were like two lines about people having disappeared and I, I didn't know about this moment in history so I needed to know um, and I just started researching it and the, the, there were some alarming similarities with the Holocaust and I felt as if, well, how, you know, why, why is this recurring in more recent history um, in another continent? Like, I need to understand why this sort of thing would recur. Um, and so I just kept researching the period and as, you know, as a fiction writer, the, the way that I understand things is through character. And mm -hmm. so trying to figure out the psychology of turning a blind eye to um, repression. Mm -hmm. And um, so how is it that a society allows um, a dictatorship to persist and prevail and what ultimately allows them to um, really see and try to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And is that something that when you were kind of doing your research, was that something you just sort of pushed on that you really tried to see like what's being left out of narratives, what's being left out of propaganda, what's being left out of the media, you know, and yet what resistance is happening anyway? Right, yeah, and um, actually, so one of the most helpful things was going to the Museum of the City of Buenos Aires, and um, I went, they have a library, and I asked the librarians if I could look at magazines from the time, and they gave me like a huge pile of magazines from like the 60s to the 80s, 
and just uh, it was great to get a very vivid picture of life in that time in popular popular culture, but also this like eerie feeling like. But these magazines, you know, they're the equivalent of People and whatever, they're not talking about what's happening. They're not talking about the arrests or the missing people. They're not talking about. Um, the protests, you know, the mothers of the disappeared started uh, having their weekly protest in front of Casa Rosada. Mm -hmm. And actually one thing that I learned was that during the time they were referred to in the media as Las Locas, mm -hmm. uh, the, oh, the crazy ladies. Yeah. Right? And it yeah. wasn't, a, you know, so when my character is abroad and she sees them referred to not as Las Locas, but like mothers of the disappeared, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a pretty... Uh, you know, life-changing moment. Sure, I mean, yeah. talk about validation, right? Yeah. To, 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 yeah, see that in press and the media, both yeah. published, but also given their rightful name and place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And, oh, so much there, so <laughs> many interesting questions. Were there other questions that evolved as you started to explore the story? Um, well, I saw, I think, I, I don't know if I, I told you they changed the name. I changed the neighborhood where the family was from, and uh, just being, you know, being in the city, they made that decision, and that sort of actually that opened up more issues of class. Mm. Um, the you know the kind of neighborhood that the mother would want to live in is sort of more um, kind of the landed gentry. So there was like also this other element of class in the in the story that, and then contrasts with her daughter running away and being on yeah. the streets in in Brooklyn in 1980 in a very um, dire situation mm -hmm. um, and her observations of you know the homeless um, at the time and the Gowanus Canal is a very polluted um, important part of the story as well having you know drawing on this idea of dirtiness um, in the you know the psychological landscape but also in the physical landscape yeah yeah Interesting. Lots of parallels there. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So in kind of early reviews of your book, um, people have talked about your luscious language. And so I just want to take a moment. And so it's in a novel, you know, it's it's not poetry, but certainly words are the, the piece that we have to tell our story. So how do you focus on that language to create, um, yeah, you know, kind of such a beautiful presence through your words? Um, yeah. So I... I do read a lot of poetry, and um, as I was, you know, as I draft, um, you know, I have a tendency to summarize a lot in an early draft because I know where I'm going, so I'm kind of rushing. So the poetry helps me pull back, uh, and um, I was also very interested in like the visceral experiences. So I was getting into like visceral detail, um, like very like concrete sensory detail, and um, also. Um, so the kinds of poet, the kinds of poetry I was reading at the time, I read all of um, Borges's poems actually, because I had read his fiction, I'd read his essays, and I wanted to keep uh, filling up on Argentine literature. So that was like that seemed like the first place to go. And then also just reading a wide variety of contemporary poetry to remind me that like that there's a you know to to stay contemporary, right? Not to get into kind of a more like over literary quality mm -hmm. as well. Um, but I read my work aloud a lot. And um, actually, I have a, a master's in teaching ESL. And learning how to teach grammar has also influenced how I write. And just like little technical things, like knowing that uh, we tend to focus on the beginning and ends of a sentence. So I always think about like having a, a better word at the beginning or the end of a sentence and then putting the less important stuff in the middle. Interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so. teaching it, you know, kind of teaching it requires a different level of understanding and a different level of engagement because it's not just that you have to use the language, you have to explain it and mm -hmm. explain how it's working at a really fundamental level. Um, how long have you been teaching ESL? Um, so I taught it for, I'm not teaching ESL anymore, mm -hmm. but I did teach it from about, yeah, 2005 to 2009, yeah, mm -hmm. right, and then I came to UW and I've been teaching creative writing ever since. Sure. Um, but I do, you know, I still use what I've learned in terms of, you know, teaching to people of various backgrounds, various needs, various learning styles and all of that stuff. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it's all that different levels of communication. You know, with English as a second language, it's basic communication. And with creative writing, it's communicating through the narrative of your characters and through the narrative of your story. 
Yeah, and and I think yeah, using that stuff has been super like. Um, I almost, <laughs> I almost didn't get an MFA. I almost pursued a doctorate in discourse analysis because I was really mm. interested in uh, like conversational cues, and um, I studied like what's the difference between like uh, like a playful fight and like an actual fight, and um, that becomes very helpful in terms of writing dialogue, like thinking about all of those things, sure. and, like the subtle cues, and yeah. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. And in terms of analyzing it too, mm -hmm. that like all those little pieces that people aren't even aware of, you know, but if you're you're slowing down, like you said, and really being in that moment and seeing what's at play, um, dog, that's, yeah, such rich depth there. Absolutely. Um, so, you, you know, you said that you weren't originally thinking of getting your Master's of Fine Arts in Creative Writing. So what ultimately drew you to fiction? Um, well, I've always been interested in fiction. I've always ri written, and um, so I had this idea that you know, if I just read a lot and wrote a lot, I could figure it out. And um, but it turned out I needed some help. Uh, <laughs> so after it took me several years to just finish a first draft of the book, and I realized like maybe if I can make an MFA work, that will be more efficient. <laughs> and, and it was right because uh, I luckily I got some funding, which brought me out to Seattle. Mm. And and um, finished, you know, the thesis was like a solid rewrite, a solid second draft, and then it was so much quicker after that. Um, I mean, there was still more time, but like, instead of several years on one draft, I went from like draft number two to like 10 drafts within about a year. Mm -hmm. um, so just like going through it again and again f with for different reasons, looking for, you know, building character still, adding more sensory detail, and then eventually like doing a find all for like the 170 instances of the word look. <laughs> <laughs> we all have those little tick words, don't yeah. we? Yes. Oh man. I uh, am also in the process of writing a novel and I have done the like search and destroy pass and it's, oh, some of the words. I mean, I even did, I'm, I like, I'm really terrible with just using the to be verb as a crutch. So was showed up. I mean, it's a very common verb and it has its place, yeah. but it's also a little bit lazy. You know, there's a lot of beautiful verbs in our language yeah. that are a lot more descriptive than was, <laughs> you know? So, oh my gosh, I think I had like, oh, I think it was 1500 was is, and I was, maybe it was 1100. It was a lot. And yeah. it was just like tapping on all of them. Like, yeah. can I make that more descriptive? Can I make that better? You know? I understand. Yeah, I definitely. I had a B. I had a two B. <laughs> well. Indeed, yeah. indeed. Yeah. Hopefully, you didn't have over a thousand. <laughs> I don't remember. It yeah. was too many. Too many. Did you have other tick words that like you knew to look for? Um, look, variations on look was a big one. I mean, like seeing was an important part of the book, mm -hmm. and um, but it was a filter word, right? That so when you take it out and you just show the reader what she's looking at, yeah. you know, you're one step further into the story. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, so it was really like, yeah, gaze, like just all of those noticed. Yeah, um, felt, <laughs> you felt, know, yeah. yes. You take out felt. You just can take out most of the felts, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yep. oh, fantastic. Um, so great. And so your book comes out December 5th. Yes. Um, so I'm lucky enough to talk to you a few days before it comes out, but likely most readers, the book will be out when you see this interview. Um, so talk to me about this release week and how are you celebrating? Um, so we're going to have a party at the Hotel Sorrento. Uh, all are welcome, although I guess this is coming out afterwards. But, uh, <laughs> it's a beautiful place. They actually, they have a silent reading party. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, anyway, like on a monthly basis, you can go and just read and have cocktails. Wonderful. Anyway, so um, we're having the party. I'm, I ordered uh, alfajores from the Salvadorian bakery. They're um, these little South American confections. Oh, delightful. Um, like little cookies filled with dulce de leche. And um, and the, my friend Corinne, who's a writer, she's going to read a little bit from her novel, on, on touching on certain similar themes, the theme of metamorphosis. And, uh, and then she'll facilitate the Q&A. And that's it, and then it's a party. And it's a party, yeah. oh, fantastic. And you know, so this is of course the culmination of 15 years of work. How did it feel to hold the book in your hands for the first time? Oh, uh, it, well, I, there was a lot of jumping around <laughs> and, and uh, hugging the book and just staring at it and fondling it for weeks. And <laughs> Uh, and uh, there was a there's a song um, that is sort of like part of it's not in the book but like thematically it's in my mm -hmm. mind related to the book uh, the singer Anoni 
who used to be Ant uh, Anthony and the Johnstons. There's a song called Bird Girl, and like I put it on, and mm -hmm. sort of like dancing around to it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. So. Oh, yeah. fantastic. What a wonderful celebration. Um, and so are you at work on the next one at this point, or uh, you know, kind of what's, what's keeping you busy now? Um, so I'm on a 10th draft of my second novel. Oh, congratulations! That's fantastic! Um, so pretty close, still trying to like, f you know, tweak little things, amp up the tension more, and um, that's about a struggling diorama artist mm. uh, who works as a paralegal during the economic crisis of 2008. Mm. Uh, and said again, in the same building as the Bernie Madoff, where Bernie Madoff was, and that whole scandal, and that blows oh, up. Oh, interesting. So, oh, man, uh, talk about another one where like the political is in the backdrop and the personal yeah. is happening alongside of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's that's what I'm working on next, and I've got some short stories, and then there's like a third novel on the back burner that I'll get back to someday. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, there's, yes. <laughs> it, it keeps the momentum going, which is mm -hmm. fantastic. Well, hopefully we can talk to you again when novel number two comes out. That would be wonderful. Yeah, and in the meantime, congratulations on Daughters of the Air, and I hope that this is just a wonderful week of celebrating its release into the world. Must readers, please do check it out, Anka Silagi's Daughters of the Air, and thank you so much for being with us. Thanks so much, Erin.